Hi, welcome everyone and good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Joan Woodward and I'm honored to lead the Travelers Institute, which is our public policy and educational arm of Travelers. Today's program is part of our Wednesdays with Woodward series that we launched last year to explore issues impacting your personal and professional lives in these really uncertain times. We're pleased you're here with us today. We hope you'll stay engaged. You can do that by joining our mailing list, uh, institute at travelers.com, connect with me directly on LinkedIn, uh, or watch our webinar replays at the travelersinstitute.org. So before we get started, I'd like to share our disclaimer about today's webinar. We have a really special program for you today. And as always, we'll save time at the end to answer your questions. So put those questions, submit them through the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. And you can send anonymously if you don't want me to read your name. But I like to read the names of all my agent and broker friends out there. So um, uh, please put your question in. Don't wait till the last minute till we're at the end of the webinar. Uh, earlier, the better. So we're thrilled to be joining our partners today and presenting this program, including the Partnership for New York City and the Duke Margolis Center for Health Policy, led by our speaker today, Dr. Mark McClellan. So a huge thanks to both of these partners for the work they're doing and helping us put these programs on for you. I'm truly honored to welcome our guest, Dr. Mark McClellan, back to our Wednesdays with Woodward series. He first joined us in January of this year, so really just six months ago, and we've asked him to come back to update us on what's happening with the pandemic and the vaccine rollouts. So Dr. McClellan is currently the Robert J. Margolis Professor of Business, Medicine, and Policy, and the founding director of the Duke Margolis Center for Health Policy at Duke University. The center draws upon Duke's research, education, and engagement capabilities to help inform policymakers in Washington and around the world to create a better healthcare system. Dr. McClellan is also a member of the board of directors at Johnson & Johnson. Prior to joining the center, Dr. McClellan served as commissioner of the US Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, under President George W. Bush, and thus has really intimate knowledge of what it takes to develop, approve, and distribute a new vaccine. In addition, Dr. McClellan is a former administrator of the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, which is all of Medicare and Medicaid uh, around the United States. It was a really big job and probably, I don't know if it was more difficult, Dr. McClellan than the FDA, but uh, <laughs> certainly as important. In these roles, he helped to implement major reforms in health policy, including adding the Medicare prescription drug benefit, uh, Medicare and Medicare payment, re Medicaid payment reforms, uh, and the FDA's Critical Path Initiative, which is the public-private initiative to develop better information of quality and cost of health care. He also serves as a member of the President's Council of Economic Advisors and a Senior Director for Healthcare Policy at the White House, and is Deputy Assistant Secretary for Economic Policy at the Department of Treasury. So he held a lot of roles during the Bush administration. He holds a PhD from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, as well as an MD and an MPA from Harvard. As many of you know, Dr. McClellan joined us, as I said, in January. So uh, his predictions were remarkably prescient for us all to understand what happened in the last six months. So over a year into this pandemic, the uh, US has invested nearly $16 billion, as you can see on our chart here, into research for COVID vaccine development and the grant of the emergency use authorization to Moderna, uh, and Pfizer, BioNTech, and J&J &J vaccines. And as you can see on my chart, never before in the history of the United States government has the FDA, um, has the government pre-bought, uh, let's say, and asked the companies to pre-manufacture drugs even before they were approved by FDA. So as we head into the summer, we find ourselves in an entirely different situation and truly much better than when we had Dr. McClellan on our Wednesday sessions in January. Um, so the fundamental questions still remain, Doctor. How will the U.S. And, and should the government support this global fight and how will that look like? How should parents protect unvaccinated children? Uh, when can we expect children to be approved under 12 years old? There's lots of questions. Uh, should we expect another surge uh, as winter comes about uh, later this year? So Dr. McClellan, there's lots to talk about. I'm going to turn it over to you for some opening remarks. And again, thanks so much for being with us. 
Hey, Joan, uh, thanks very much for having me back. And it's great to be with you and the rest of the travelers community. Looking forward to discussing all of those issues. I guess just to start with, uh, boy, Joan, what a difference six months makes. Since the, the last time we were here, we talked about how vaccines could potentially lead to a transformation in the impact of the pandemic. And you know, great news is we're really starting to see that happen. I think summer in the United States looks very good good. It especially looks good for people who have been vaccinated. The vaccines look very effective, not only against the COVID that we face so far, but against some of the variants that are continuing to emerge. Uh, that plus the good weather and people being out more, I think is going to make the, the, the summer prospects look very good. We're already down to well under uh, 30,000 cases per day, numbers that we haven't seen since before the big surges of, of last summer, um, 300 or fewer deaths per day. That's not not yet crushing the virus. It's still with us. There are still a significant number of people who haven't been vaccinated. There's still some spread of the virus going on. And that's part of the reasons to be a bit worried for the future with what may happen in the fall as the weather gets uh, tougher, people get even more time closer back together. We certainly haven't solved the COVID problems around the world where with much less availability of highly effective and safe vaccines. We're still seeing continued uh, uh, serious outbreaks and the continued emergence of very worrisome variant forms of the virus, which inevitably you know, make their way back around the world. Uh, so those are still some things to be on the lookout for. We're not done, uh, but we are at a point where I think we can all take a deep breath, uh, take the mask off in many more places and, uh, and look forward to um, um, much better times ahead without anything like those kinds of big, acute surges and high rates of hospitalization that we've seen in the past. Hopefully those are well behind us. Well, good. You know, um, it's uh, it's interesting how uh, the Biden administration came in and, and he asked us all to wear a mask for another 100 days. And then, uh, of course, there was some shifting. And then the CDC, surprisingly, all of a sudden said, it's OK, we can take off our masks. And I think a lot of people were thinking the CDC was too slow and then all of a sudden maybe too fast mm -hmm. in taking off our masks. So how do we kind of balance? Uh, there's lots of signs on restaurants and in different shops you go into. Uh, if you've had your vaccine, you don't have to wear your mask in many, many states. Uh, and there's kind of this messy middle that we're in right now. How are you thinking about this uh, for society at large in terms of, is it okay to go to those summer picnics indoor, outdoor, without masks if you've been fully vaccinated, knowing that there might be people in the room who have not been vaccinated who also don't have a mask on? How are you thinking about that personally? You know, it is a it is a little bit messy, and I, I'm be sure to get me to come back to how I'm thinking about this personally. But first, just to set a little context, um, you know, CDC has been kind of criticized on both sides along the way. For a while, they were criticized of not moving their guidance fast enough, and they came out with some guidance on wearing masks with a with a chart that had a whole bunch of compartments for different kinds of people and different kinds of settings it was very hard for people to follow. Um, I think some of that plus some more accumulating evidence on how people especially who have been vaccinated are doing the real world zone uh, is what led to that change in guidance. So we now know not only are the vaccines available widely now here in the US uh, very effective in preventing any kind of serious infections are also very effective in preventing symptoms, but they're also very effective in just keeping you from even acquiring levels of the virus, let alone producing enough, even if you're asymptomatic without symptoms to make people around you infected. And it's that evidence from large numbers of people in the United States and Israel and, and countries that have gotten to fairly high levels of vaccination and seen big drops in transmission, not just among you know, really eliminating serious infections, uh, except very rarely in people who have been vaccinated, um, but also protecting people who aren't vaccinated from uh, picking up cases from being around them. 
uh, that that's what led to the the change in the CDC guidance, and I think it's it's right. Uh, basically, if you've been fully vaccinated for at least a couple of weeks, the chance that you're going to have an infection that's serious is very very low. It does happen. We have seen a few deaths in nursing homes and and elsewhere among high risk people who have been vaccinated who had so called breakthrough infections, but it's at very low rates. You know, one per ten or hundred thousand uh, of such. Uh, cases. And, and those cases are getting much rarer because there is so much less transmission. So uh, if you've been vaccinated, uh, you can be pretty confident that, that you're not going to have any serious consequences wherever you are um, from the COVID cases that, that are still circulating at this much lower level in the United States. On the other hand, if you're not vaccinated, you are still at risk. And what we've seen in those hospitalizations that are unfortunately still taking place and the deaths that are unfortunately still taking place that shifted to people who are younger, who are vaccinated at a lower rate, you know, something like uh, 85% of our 65 plus population has gotten at least one shot, three quarters are fully immunized. We're seeing much relatively less hospitalizations in those high risk groups. More of them are in younger people, including younger people with uh, chronic diseases or obesity or, or something like that who aren't vaccinated. So the vast majority of hospitalizations and deaths now are among people who aren't vaccinated. And that's why the CDC also tried to be very clear about if you haven't been vaccinated, the evidence is now pretty strong that you may be okay outdoors if you're not around other people in close uh, contact. Uh, but if you're in indoors in a situation with lots of other people around you, that's still a risk. Um, so it, it's a big change in guidance, but I think it's reflecting the fact, Joan, that, that we're in a much less serious phase of the pandemic where we're actually trying and should be trying to do a lot more things that were like the things that we used to do in the past. It's still not the case that there's no risk, uh, but based on the, your vaccination status, based on whether other people in the area um, are close to you have been vaccinated or not, and then based on the rate of cases in the area. In most parts of the US now are down to fewer than five cases per 10,000 people. That's a very low rate compared to what it's been in the past. And all of those means that the risk isn't zero, but it's pretty low. So back to what I'm doing personally, uh, outdoors, not around anybody close to anybody. Of course, I'm not uh, wearing a mask. Um, indoors, if I'm in a setting where um, I'm pretty confident that they're not people who aren't vaccinated around me, um, uh, gatherings, things like that. Um, I'm, I don't wear a mask. Uh, in settings where there maybe is a mixed group, uh, more people close together, including some who may not be vaccinated, I try to be a little bit more careful. And, and that's why I think you're still seeing federal guidance uh, for on airplanes and, and other sort of congregate places where people come together, including you know, a number of people who haven't been vaccinated yet. I think that's why you're still seeing some CDC guidance suggesting masks in those contexts. Okay, that's very, very, very good advice for us. And, and thank you for speaking uh, to us about what you're doing personally. I think uh, a lot of us follow the lead of, of people like you and, and others in, in public policy who know what you're doing. So thank you. Um, so, so are these lifting of restrictions here to stay or come the fall or winter, are we gonna hunker down and maybe close down this, the economy again? Or you know, are we thinking that we need to get these booster shots um, you know, maybe later this year or is that a next year phenomenon in terms of getting the annual kind of booster? Well, I think uh, for the short term, the summer looks very good. So I think people should be getting on with their lives, but we are definitely not done with the pandemic. So in the United States, while we've gotten a lot of people vaccinated, over 300 million shots delivered, and especially for people in older age groups, uh, we still have about 64% of adults that have gotten at least one shot. That means 36% who haven't. Now, many of those people are actually actually immune. Some of the people who haven't gotten vaccinated did get COVID. We've really underestimated the number of uh, total COVID cases in the U.S., and at least for a while, uh, those people have immunity too. And that's why I think we're seeing you know, very low spread rates in many parts of the country right now. 
but uh, it doesn't mean that we're beyond the pandemic yet. So I think as a business, you know, paying some attention to things like um, you know, distancing turns out to be a le bit less important than we thought about that we thought it was early on, uh, because there is a possibility of airborne spread, especially from someone who's not vaccinated um, uh, and uh, and is infected. So uh, air circulation in office I think is something that everybody should be paying attention to. It's good for reducing risk of COVID uh, now, even though that risk is lower, but also other uh, respiratory infections. You know, again, keeping this uh, culture in place of not coming into work if you've uh, got symptoms uh, or fever or things like that. Um, so not, we're not stopping everything. Uh, we're also continuing as a nation to monitor cases around the country, including the variants. Um, one reason the cases haven't gone down even lower with all this vaccination is that the, unfortunately, the variants we're seeing now, they're just more contagious and, and some of them are, are, are more, um, uh, more serious in terms of the symptoms and complications they cause and the, the variants we were dealing with just a few months ago. Uh, so we have to keep a close eye on that. And we also have to keep a close eye on how well the, the vaccines keep working and how long immunity lasts for people who were infected but haven't been vaccinated. So the government's watching this closely. I expect to see, you know, they're, they're certainly preparing, having enough additional vaccine doses available so that everyone could be vaccinated again if, if need be. Fortunately, the durability of the vaccine so far, including the durability against variant seems to be holding. So, you know, no rush to go off and get a booster now, but people should expect that at some point they may need a, a, another shot, especially if they're in a, a higher risk group that, that, you know, is more at risk of these serious uh, complications. And then the other thing I watch heading into fall is we had a lot of people who were infected last last summer, last fall, uh, this past winter, um, we don't think that immunity overall is as good for people who have been infected as it is for people who have gotten shots. So that immunity could start to drop. In fact, in some people at very mild cases, they can get reinfected by a variant. And so that's another reason why we're kind of worried about what could happen uh, in the fall. Um, so I think the most important thing we could do for, for preparation for the fall now, though, Joan, is uh, is keep working on our uh, vaccination outreach uh, efforts. There, there are certainly many Americans who have thought about it and decided pretty clearly they, they don't want it. Um, a few of them are still changing their minds. They see more of this experience as businesses take steps to either incentives or in some cases requirements. Uh, to, to get vaccinated, um, uh, but uh, there's still a, a, a chunk of Americans who think they want to get vaccinated, just haven't gotten around to it yet, may think, well, you know, cases are going down, summer looks good, I'll do it later. I think the more we can get those individuals vaccinated as well, the, the safer we're going to be for the long term. Okay, <clears throat> terrific. All right, now we're going to mix it up. For all of you listening in today to us, uh, we're going to, they're going to try something new technology-wise. Hopefully, hopefully it works. So uh, right now on your screen, you should see a window pop up with an audience polling question. Hopefully that happens. And um, so uh, please be honest. Your responses are anonymous. So we promise you that. So here's the question. Do you think the economic rebound will be dependent on more people getting vaccinated in order to reach that herd immunity, yes or no? So do you think the economic rebound is really dependent on herd immunity? And let's see what the um, audience is telling us here. It looks like uh, to me, 73% of us uh, think that's true. The economic rebound is dependent on more people getting vaccinated to reach herd immunity. So 27% of us, uh, Dr. McClellan say, Nope, we don't need to do that. The economic rebound is going to happen even if we don't mm. reach herd immunity. What are your thoughts here? Uh, I, I, I actually voted yes on this one, Joan, but I can see why people would vote no. We're seeing a, a very good economic recovery taking place right now to the extent that um, for many jobs, it's hard to find people who, who want them. It's hard to get the economy going again as, as fast as some employers would like. And that's with well below levels of herd immunity, as I, as I was talking about earlier. Uh, that said, um, I think there are going to be pockets of outbreaks in the United States. States, maybe some people not doing as much in terms of getting out there, 
you know, eating indoors, doing big events, maybe traveling quite as much, if they still see this, this level of uh, infection taking place on an ongoing basis, you know, it's low, but it's, it's there. Uh, so there's still some risk there. That's going to make some people um, uh, anxious. But I think the question was focused on the United States. The fact of the matter is, from the standpoint of our long-term and comprehensive economic recovery, we have to contain COVID all over the world. And that is just not happening yet. We're nowhere near uh, even high, you know, decent immunization levels, let alone anything like herd immunity on most of the planet. Uh, uh, in Southeast Asia and parts of the Asia Pacific and parts of Africa, and especially in parts of Central and South America that our uh, economy does depend on uh, and recovery globally is going to depend on, we're just not close to being there yet. And that's going to be a bit of a drag on the economic recovery uh, globally, for sure, and the U.S. to a more limited extent. Yeah, no, no, the global question and all of us are deciding, you know, can we plan that European vacation uh, this summer? And I think most of, most of the folks I, I'm, you know, working with and, and talking to, people are very hesitant to go abroad uh, for, for obviously the reasons you say, but we do want to plan it for next summer, right? And so getting the global population to uh, anywhere near herd immunity uh, is a huge heavy lift. So, so I want to get to that in a second, but I, I want to ask our audience one more question on this topic of you know mask on, mask off. So here's another audience polling question for everyone um, and select all that apply here. Which of these activities, if any, are you engaged in? So indoor gatherings without a mask, indoor shopping without a mask, air travel for business, have you taken a vacation yet, air travel for pleasure or none of the above? So again, check everything that applies here and let's see what some of these results are gonna look like. Who's doing what? So, all right, we have 76% of us say they're doing things inside without a mask, uh, including shopping. About 50% of us say we're shopping without a mask. Uh, air travel for business, look at this. Isn't this interesting for all of my agent broker and other insurance professionals on the line? So only 6% of us have taken that first business trip. And that is going to be very interesting to watch for all the fall conferences um, that we're planning and hoping to execute fall and winter. Air travel for pleasure. So people don't mind getting on a plane, Dr. McClellan, for, for a little vacation, but maybe more hesitant on the business side. And then 17% of us said we're not doing any of these. Uh, we're still considering this maybe risky behavior. So what do you, what do you make of these results? Uh, and maybe speak to the business community too about how fast reopening and you know getting our, our folks back in the office which is a you know obviously a daily question for everyone sure sure I'll, I'll try to cover all of these um on the first two you know i do think it's uh, for me it's it's back to what i was saying before is it depends so um and and for business travel too some of that is is coming back and i think again for all of these if you've been vaccinated you are you are very very unlikely uh, to have any to have an infection number one to have any serious consequences of that infection uh, uh for sure. So I've actually done, uh, uh, Joan, all of these. I actually just got back from a business trip uh, recently where I traveled with a, a mask on uh, in, the, in the plane per requirements, but went to an indoor meeting uh, of a group that was completely vaccinated. And it was just like old times. You know, we we're sitting at the table, we we're having good discussions, uh, no masks and, and no evidence of any. And I think the CDC would agree, no evidence of any uh, worries there. It wasn't a, a mask gathering of hundreds of people, uh, some of whom, many of whom may not be vaccinated. In those settings, I would still, if I went to them, I would still wear a mask, but that's more to protect people who haven't been vaccinated than, than um, con concerns for, for me. Um, and for indoor shopping, you know, it depends too, if it's a, a good uh, air circulation, not that crowded, and you've been vaccinated, you know, that's getting to be more of the, the norm around the United States. A lot of major um, uh, 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 retail chains have, have dropped their mask requirements. They, they are asking you to, uh, to, to you know, pay attention to whether you've been vaccinated or not as to whether you, you mask up. Uh, if you look at surveys, though, a lot of people who haven't been vaccinated aren't wearing masks, something like that, half and half. Uh, they're actually the group that's at the, the biggest risk uh, at this stage in the pandemic. 
And uh, I am doing um, some air travel for pleasure. Um, we have a family trip coming up that we're going to fly. Uh, we'll be masked uh, in flight. We're going to an area where we're not going to be in big crowds. This is a great summer for, for seeing the, the great outdoors around the United States. And um, uh, Joan actually has some travel coming up uh, to, to Europe later this summer. And for international travel, I say it very much depends on the situation in the country that you're going to. It, it's quite varied across the world. Uh, looking at Europe, they are mostly not as vaccinated as we are in Western, uh, Western Europe versus the United States, but those numbers are increasing rapidly and we're going to see case rates continue to go down, uh, even in countries in Europe that have been hit harder by some of the new variants like the so-called Delta variant. Um, but if you're vaccinated, wearing a mask on the plane and going to some place that, that has a low, very low case rate um, that, that's doing a good job of tracking outbreaks including even if there's some of the variants there, but I mean, doing a good job of containing outbreaks, um, I think a, a good deal of international travel is okay. And I think that's going to not be back anywhere near 100% this year, just like business travel won't be, but I expect it to continue to pick up over the course of the summer. Okay, terrific. So um, let's talk about children just for a moment. We know that it's been approved, the vaccine's been approved for 12 to 15 year olds. Trials are underway now for six months to 12 year olds. What's what's the take up rate now for children uh, 12 to 15? Are they out there getting their vaccines? Uh, they are. They're not yet at the rates that we're seeing for adults, but uh, basically the further down you go the age distribution, the lower the vaccination rate is, um, but the 12 to 15 year olds are, are catching up. Uh, I'd say that the numbers now, it's hard to get exact numbers, but it's definitely a minority, maybe 15, 20 percent uh, in that age group that have been vaccinated. Um, many of them, uh, there, there's a push and we saw an, an increase uh, just in the last couple of the last week or so in that age group. I think related to summer camp starting and summer trips starting where um, if, you, if you're if uh, you adolescent and have been vaccinated, you know, same things we're just talking about with masks. Uh, you, can, you can do a lot more safely uh, without the mask uh, than, than you could otherwise. Um, so I think that number is going to continue to increase. Um, uh, I don't expect most school districts to require vaccination, but it to be maybe required in some, strongly encouraged in many uh, as we head into the fall. And Joan, as you mentioned, there are studies underway now for vaccination vaccination effectiveness and safety in younger kids under 12 all the way down to six months. Uh, Pfizer and Moderna have announced that the doses that they're using, this is a little bit complicated in that um, kids have quite strong immune responses. So they need lower doses, not just because they've got a lower body weight, but because they can restrong, you know, you want a strong response, but not so strong that you get allergic reactions or, uh, or avoidable side effects. So people are going to be careful about these dosing studies, and that's going to take a little bit of time to sort out. So I think it's probably going to be some months before we see any clear definitive results and FDA decisions about vaccination in the under 12 um, age group. But I would expect to see some recommendations on vaccination. I think we're going to find doses that are safe and effective for, uh, for, for kids in that um, age range, um, probably before the end of the year, or by the end of the year uh, sort of time frame. Okay, great. Um, let's pivot a little bit and talk about incentives. So states like Ohio are giving you a chance to win a million dollars. Uh, states like Maryland, West Virginia are just giving you a hundred bucks to get your, your vaccine. So do these incentives work? And what lessons can we learn from them? Uh, and a lot of businesses are starting to do this. What is your kind of advice yeah. if you're talking to a CEO who's worried about you know, getting people back in the office or people are worried about coming back in the office, going on public transport to get to the office is a big concern. Do these incentives actually work? You know, they, they do work, uh, Joan. People like uh, free donuts or uh, free, uh, uh, free beer with their shot uh, uh, or other gifts. They especially like cash. So the, um, some of the financial incentives um, for younger um, people, um, um, a chance of winning a, a savings bond or a free college education, that's great. Uh, uh, the lotteries you mentioned, a growing number of states are uh, using some of their federal funds actually to support lotteries. And some people have criticized that, but the evidence is that it does get people's attention. It does help uh, get those 
people who've maybe been on the edge, you know, they, they think it's okay to get a vaccine, they just haven't taken all the steps to do it yet, um, it does make a difference. And here, employers really can help. We've done a lot of uh, work at our center at Duke uh, on what uh, steps employers are taking that can uh, support vaccination. Some of it e isn't even um, financial incentives or gifts so much as it is the incentive of like, just reducing the difficulty of getting vaccinated. So uh, doing a vaccination um, program at work or close to work, there are enough uh, vaccines available now that you can usually work with your local uh, state or local public health authority uh, to find a, a partnership to do it. There are many community organizations that uh, likely are connected to your employees who could uh, help support an event. We're seeing these happen all over the country in, in partnerships with community organizations um, and with state and local public health, uh, also with pharmacies and healthcare organizations, they can set up a clinic. So bring the, uh, the vaccines to the, the, the workers is a great way to do it. Uh, make it easy for the workers to get to the vaccines. Uh, many employers have offered uh, free transportation or uh, time off from work for the, the shot, um, plus the, uh, the, the recovery period, you know, the day or so that it might take to, to get over the uh, the symptoms in, in, in some people. Uh, right now, uh, for uh, till July 4th, you can actually get a free trip to and from a vaccine via Uber or, or, or Lyft. Um, uh, they're offering free vaccine uh, transportation. It's, you know, all you got to do is use the app. They'll tell you, they'll tell you how to do it. So it's telling employees about how easy it is to get vaccinated. And uh, there is a vaccination site available close to you. You can just text on your phone, uh, get vax uh, with your zip code. So whatever that sixth letter, I keep forgetting the, the, the specific six numbers, but get vax, put in your zip code, text it, you'll get a list back just on your phone of, of oh, places wow. where you can get a vaccine um, uh, close by. Uh, and then the Uber ride or the Lyft ride if you need transportation. The other things that I think we're going to see employers doing more going forward are uh, maybe um, uh, having some incentives um, uh, or even requirements. So uh, we've seen some of the airlines uh, like United say that for new hires, they have to be vaccinated. And for some healthcare and other organizations, um, uh, including uh, Memorial Baptist in, uh, uh, in Houston, um, they're requiring uh, their workers to be vaccinated. Some universities are, are doing that. Um, Duke is doing that for its students. And I wouldn't be surprised if we end up by the fall having a requirement for our, our um, uh, staff and, um, uh, and faculty too. There, there are some federal regulatory issues. You can't just make everyone get vaccinated. You have to account for things like uh, religious uh, preferences and um, medical or, or other, uh, you know, scientifically appropriate reasons why people might not want to be vaccinated. Um, but I think we're going to see these incentives in the coming months, especially as the new, as the uh, Pfizer and Moderna vaccines and eventually the J&J vaccine get approved for full use. So full approval, not just emergency use. Uh, I think we're going to see more employers um, putting requirements in place. But right now, what really does work is publicizing information, making sure people know their places they can go to get more information if they've got questions, their healthcare provider, local resource groups, probably people they trust uh, from their community. Uh, and it's uh, very easy and we've seen lots of great examples of setting up vaccine clinics or connecting people with, with close by vaccine opportunities to make this as easy as possible. Okay, terrific. Um, so for lay people like us, people who don't have a PhD or, or have a medical degree, what is the difference between emergency use authorization and kind of regular authorization without getting too technical on us, but yep. what is the actual difference? So in, in practically, there's not that much difference when it comes to vaccines. What the emergency use authorization gives FD, FDA the ability to do is in a public health emergency like this one, uh, it can approve medical products with, a, with, with less comprehensive evidence than the agency might normally require. And that meant that FDA did some faster approvals, especially for treatments for people who are really sick especially earlier on in the pandemic when we didn't have that much to offer them uh, based on quite limited evidence. So, you know, for example, I saw in the chat a couple of questions about, well, what do I do if I'm, uh, if I or somebody I know is 
immune compromised and so doesn't have, you know, isn't unlucky enough not to have a good response to the vaccine. Well, those people probably do need to be more careful about where they're going and, and also wear a mask for their own uh, protection. But it's also important to remember that we actually have treatments that work now if you get them soon enough after you're infected. So if you're in a high risk group, for example, someone who's immune compromised and you think you might have COVID, you've got symptoms, um, get tested. It's uh, not testing isn't quite as widely available as it used to be, but you can get it from your local pharmacy and, and uh, many um, uh, healthcare providers uh, uh, close to where you are. If the test is positive, uh, get referred for to uh, receive a monoclonal antibody treatment. This is a infusion or injection. It's, it's you know, not something you can, not just a pill you can take yet. We're working on that, but it's really effective. And FDA last year uh, approved the availability of those monoclonal antibody treatments based on studies in just a limited number of people because uh, it was so important for, for people who are at high risk to prevent hospitalization and death. In contrast for the vaccines, FDA recognize that the vast majority of people who'd be using them are people who are healthy. And so that's a different proposition. You know, in that case, you really want to be sure that the vaccine is safe as well as effective before you start using it more widely. And you've seen uh, over the past um, uh, six months, a lot of efforts by FDA and CDC and other government agencies and healthcare providers and the manufacturers, uh, not only to make sure the vaccine was effective, that it really does prevent the uh, complications, even getting COVID, uh, like I was talking about before, but also really understanding the, the safety. And so FDA didn't authorize these vaccines until very large clinical trials on tens of thousands of people have been done. Uh, and it's continuing to watch while the vaccines are in use for very rare side effects, like this rare side effect in the J&J &J vaccine, which is something like, you know, three per million people uh, who have this um, condition where they're, uh, they have some, some blood clotting uh, in the presence of, of uh, low levels of the, 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 the products in your bloodstream that normally cause cause blood to clot. And that's important, both because it's a rare condition, but also because it can be treated. You just need to know the right treatment. And so those kinds of steps uh, help the FDA get the sort of the large scale, long-term use evidence that goes into a full approval, as well as uh, Joan, just watching to see, you know, how long does the vaccine last on the shelf? Well, you know, you, you haven't had time to look at these um, long-term uh, issues like uh, how long a vaccine lasts. And, and we now had, you know, uh, data on hundreds of millions of people, literally, who have gotten vaccinated here and around the world. So that's the additional evidence that will go into a full approval. Uh, but I have a, because there's just not that much difference from what went into the emergency authorizations, um, I think we're not going to learn a whole lot more about the safety and effectiveness of the vaccines between now and when those full approvals happen. The FDA set a very high bar for vaccines for emergency use authorization. Okay, thank you. Thank you for explaining that. It's very, very interesting behind the scenes look at the FDA. So we're going to open up to audience questions now, but first I want to take one more shot at this on the global uh, global response. And so you felt strongly enough, Dr. McClellan, to write an open letter uh, calling on the Biden administration uh, a few weeks ago to provide, quote, urgent high level U.S. leadership to address the global vaccine crisis. So you and I think 10 other you know, yeah. leading scholars on health policy. Well, why did you do that? And, and what has anything happened since then? Well, Joan, that's really the, I think the, the most important, really big and challenging next step that we need to take to really move beyond the pandemic here in the U US, but also for the rest of the world. Um, so what I'd like to see is something like what we did in the US with Operation Warp Speed to really ramp up the production of, of a very effective, safe, high quality vaccines. You know, it is hard uh, to manufacture these vaccines. We are incredibly lucky that we have multiple vaccines here in the US and Western Europe that work. It's a testament to the, um, the, the effectiveness and innovation in our biotechnology sector. But most of the rest of the world doesn't have access to that. And unfortunately, uh, as we've seen in this country, it's not so simple. It's just saying, well, you know, let's share the patents or share the share the IP and, and, and hope for the best. Um, what worked here was 
investing a lot in increasing capacity. And we're doing some of that now um, for the reasons that we talked about before. The U.S. is, I think, understandably creating more manufacturing and, and supply of these very good vaccines than we're likely to need here in the U.S. because we want to be ready just in case. We want to be ready if there's a variant that requires boosters sooner. We want to be ready with the capacity to make a modified vaccine if there's a very worrisome uh, variant that comes along. We want to be ready if you know, one of the manufacturers' uh, uh, manufacturing capacity goes down a bit. We want to be ready for all of those things. Fortunately, we're probably not going to see all of those bad things happen, and therefore we're going to end up with a lot of extra doses of really good vaccines. And what we don't have yet, Joan, is a systematic way to work with our allies. And President uh, B- uh, Biden is over at uh, heading over to G7 right now. So these are the, the other countries that have the benefits of the same kind of vaccines that are working here uh, and are taking the same kinds of steps that we are. In some ways, a little bit behind, some of them a little bit ahead, maybe. Um, but that's going to create, by our estimate, uh, potentially a billion extra doses of vaccines over the next six months. And that means we need a real plan to get those shots into arms where they're so badly needed uh, across the world. Um, If we take steps to to make these vaccine supply available, if we maybe ramp them up, um, J&J, you know, you mentioned I'm on the board, is doing a partnership now that was sponsored by the U.S. government, the government of Australia, with an advanced um, manufacturer in India called BioE that's aiming to have a billion dose production capacity using J&J know-how, you know, working side by side getting that up and running uh, over the next six months. Vaccine production is complex. You got to do it exactly right, as we've seen with all the issues with, you know, the so-called emergent uh, facility here in the U.S. You got to do it right, uh, but we can do more of that. Uh, So steps like that in Africa as well with the U.S. government, our allies, and the the really good vaccine manufacturers working together to increase capacity, um, that could give us the ability to get a large share of people throughout the world vaccinated this year. And looking ahead, um, Joan, I think the good news is globally, we're gonna have a glut of vaccines uh, by 2022. We should be able to vaccinate, if we stay on track, uh, everybody uh, who wants to be vaccinated from these high quality vaccines, Pfizer, Moderna, J&J, AstraZeneca, uh, Novavax, CureVax, everybody in your chart uh, is ramping up supplies and they have the capacity to probably do 11, 12 billion doses uh, in 2022. Um, But we need to accelerate that as much as possible, given the the horrible situation that we've seen in India in the last few weeks and many parts of South America right now. Um, That's all avoidable if we just take the steps that work here and apply them globally. One other thing I'd mention here that's important is just like we've seen in the U.S., it's not enough to have good vaccines. You have to have a real plan to get those shots out into arms. So you need vaccinators, uh, you need um, uh, distribution programs, and that's hard for some of these vaccines that have to be start sort at ultra cold uh, temperatures. And the world has never done a vaccination program for adults on this scale. Closest thing was probably polio vaccination, you know, generation or so ago in kids. And so most countries we've looked and we did a study on this, most countries don't yet have that capacity in place. So we could be in a bad situation in a few months, uh, Joan, where we've got more of these really good vaccine supplies available, but no reliable way to get those shots into arms. We've already seen that happen in a few countries where um, the COVAX, this international collaboration, has distributed some of these good vaccines to countries that weren't actually able to distribute them and, and they either were wasted or they had to be sent back. That's not a solution. And that's the kind of collaborative effort that we called for. The US led an effort like this in the early 2000s when I was in the White House working with President Bush, uh, the president's emergency plan for AIDS relief uh, brought uh, literally billions of doses of of medications for AIDS uh, to Sub-Saharan Africa, Asia, other parts of the world where uh, AIDS was was rampant, despite the fact that we had really effective vaccines, that, uh, very, really effective treatments, I'm sorry, that had been developed in the U.S. We just didn't have a, a plan to get them in place. And it took U.S. leadership. It wasn't, it was, it was, you know, some billions of dollars, but in the scheme of things, it wasn't huge amounts of money when the benefit on the other side is 
you know, not losing um, millions of lives, not you losing uh, the opportunity for the rest of the world's economies to, uh, to recover. So we've got some real work to do there uh, to move past the pandemic globally. Okay, to the audience questions, we have a lot coming in as you see. So let's try to do rapid fire here. Um, okay. First one coming in from Sarah Rose. Do you mention the mass majority of deaths are people who are not vaccinated. In the clinical trials, we did not see any deaths of people who are fully vaccinated. So are we starting to see deaths of people who are fully vaccinated in the general population? And what is the outlook for this? Very, very rarely. So even a vaccine that is almost perfect, as you said, had no deaths in the um, clinical trials and tens of thousands of people had uh, rates of just a few percent of people having uh, serious consequences, very low rates of hospitalization. Um, there have been a few deaths. There was a nursing home outbreak uh, uh, not that long ago in the Midwest where um, uh, an unvaccinated workers brought in um, some cases, uh, COVID that, that spread to some of the other uh, people in the nursing home. Remember, we're dealing with tougher variants now that are, that are more contagious and, and can cause um, uh, more consequences. And there was one death in that case. But the CDC has looked at the total data in the U.S. We're seeing this in other countries too. Uh, Joan, the rates of that happening are so, so low. Uh, it's down, it's up there with, you know, getting struck by lightning or something like that. And so, you know, there, there's no medicine that's, that's completely perfect, especially for people who are very high risk, but these are about as close as we've ever seen medicine be able to do. And those risks for people who are vaccinated are so low uh, that it shouldn't stand in the way of their um, getting out and, and getting back towards enjoying at least some of their life as, as we talked about before. I would feel even better, as we said, if, if more people get vaccinated. I mean, there'd be less chance of those cases to spread, less chance for variants to, to, to move around. And that's just gonna protect everybody. People who are vaccinated, people who are unvaccinated. And especially in areas where there are unvaccinated people, you still need to be careful. Um, some testing, uh, some distancing, some uh, you know, air, paying uh, careful attention to air circulation, all of those are, are still good steps to, to reduce risks uh, in indoor higher risk settings. Okay, <clears throat> another question coming in from Marilyn West. Should evidence of vaccinations be required for travel and other purposes such as return to work? How do you balance this requirement against HIPAA protections? Excellent question. It's a great question, and different countries are going to come out in different places on this, where they have you know, different societal approaches to how they deal with um, uh, privacy concerns versus you know, social uh, population concerns. So um, uh, if you're in Singapore now, um, uh, the, you, you, they're keeping track of, of where you're going, um, not just to know whether you've been vaccinated and can, can do more, uh, but also to continue to be able to track outbreaks and, and things like that. Um, Israel kind of in the middle when they were at an earlier stage and, you know, they ramped up fast on vaccination and got a, made a lot of news for getting up to a significant share of their population being vaccinated vaccinated by in the February, March timeframe, they saw their uh, rates of infection, including with the, these worrisome variants go way, way, way down. And they had sort of a vaccine pass that they use for a while. This is a, a green or red uh, uh, check you could get on your phones, whether you're vaccinated. And they made the rules different. Um, if you were, you know, back to Joan, what we were talking about earlier, if you were vaccinated and um, you go to a mall, be in crowds, go to a concert uh, with, with really no significant uh, risk associated with it, the risk of, of both spread and and the risk of complications is much more in people who are unvaccinated. Well, since then, uh, Israel's seen the, the case rates go way down and they've relaxed those restrictions, even though they didn't get to quite herd immunity, immunity levels. They're at about 60% or so of their um, adult population who's been, or their overall population who's been vaccinated. So over 70% of, uh, of adults, and at least for now, in the summer, warm weather, et cetera, uh, that's been enough to keep the infection rates really, really low. And so they're allowing some more flexibility they're still encouraging masks and people who aren't vaccinated. In the U.S., the federal government's made a decision that they're not going to impose uh, any kind of um, passport. Uh, there, you know, one, uh, several states are supporting these kinds of efforts. New York, 
Um, and more states have enabled businesses to implement these kinds of requirements. You know, if you're uh, trying to go to a baseball game in Southern California, you can get uh, better seats closer together with all your friends if you can demonstrate that you're vaccinated. So there is going to be a role um, for these vaccine passports. So there's another question about cruises in here. Um, so that's another place where businesses have thought it was good business, at least for many of the cruise ships, to not only vaccinate, require their crews to be vaccinated, uh, but also require all or almost all of their passengers to demonstrate proof of vaccination before getting on the cruise. Because again, it makes for a very, uh, very low risk environment. Um, but there are some U.S. states, including Florida, that have, have state um, restrictions actually on imposing on businesses imposing any um, mandates about um, uh, vaccine passport use. And basically, the state of Florida said if you're a business, you cannot use uh, these passport approaches. That has not wor worked out yet. So uh, we'll see how the cruises go out of Florida in July. That may be a live uh, flashpoint uh, for, for this issue. Um, I think in, in, um, from the public health side, um, having these um, programs be available to businesses if they want to use it um, uh, is helpful. It's certainly going to be helpful for you know reopening the, the Duke campus and other college campuses with confidence this fall. That's why we're requiring vaccination and proof of vaccination to be on campus. Um, and so I think you're going to see a lot of businesses in that category, but it is, it is mixed in the United States. We're definitely using this approach less than other places. One other place you may end up seeing it is in international travel. Uh, if you want to go to Paris, uh, a lot of people missed that over the past year. Um, France just announced, uh, I think today, uh, that uh, they're reopening for foreign visitors if you have proof of vaccination or you can do the, uh, the, the uh, PCR tests and, and, and prove that you're not infected. Okay, uh, a couple other questions here, and I'm very impressed that you can speak and also read the questions in the chat. I, mean, <laughs> well, I caught all of them. I need your help. <laughs> You're sifting through the questions and speaking to another question, so impressive. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's a couple of folks here, uh, anonymous, saying they what are the options for people who got an allergic reaction to that first shot? They feel like they're going to have to wear a mask forever. What do they do if they had the allergic reaction? Uh, to the first shot, and obviously you're not going to, sounds like they're not going to get the second shot. Uh, talk to your doctor. So there are different levels of allergic reactions. The good thing about allergic reactions is they are very treatable. They, they happen right away, and they're very treatable if you're observing carefully. So that's why for everybody who's been vaccinated, you have to wait 15 minutes there just to make sure you're not going to have a very serious anaphylactic shock type reaction. There are a lot of people who have had uh, allergic reactions that are milder than that. And I think for those in individuals, it's worth a conversation with your physician about whether there's a way by using um, uh, an antihistamine treatment or another treatment to, to moderate that allergic reaction, you could still go ahead and get vaccinated. Um, the, the number of people who have truly serious enough allergic reactions not to be uh, able to use um, uh, one of the vaccines is very, very low. And another thing to ask is remember that we've got now several different vaccines available. There probably will be more available soon, you know, back to your chart. So important to ask your physician, even if you had a fairly serious allergic reaction to one type of vaccine, we're lucky to have several different kinds of vaccines where you may not have a reaction to the others. Okay, great. Um, so uh, what about uh, people who are pregnant? This has come up a couple of different times. Is there a better uh, in, in outcome for individuals in their first trimester, or second trimester, or third trimester to get the vaccine? Is there any the, difference? Or? Yeah, the risk of the vaccine looks very low. So we haven't done those same really, really large randomized clinical trials that give us such definitive evidence in other populations. Uh, but from studies of people now, tens of thousands of, of pregnant women who have gotten vaccinated at each stage uh, in their pregnancy, um, the results look very good. Um, no signs of any um, serious adverse effects uh, and actually benefits uh, in two ways. One is uh, people who are pregnant and get COVID 
do have more serious outcomes. And that is actually a threat to early um, uh, labor and, and other complications with the, the pregnancy. Um, and second, the um, antibodies that you make in response to the vaccine uh, are transmitted across the placenta and uh, in uh, breast milk. Uh, and so that does help provide some immunity for um, uh, uh, your, your infant uh, and, and the baby before it's born. Uh, okay, on the flip side of that question, Nicole Lockwood asked, uh, what about women's fertility? Any negative side effects? Or was there any testing done with uh, fertility? Uh, yeah. after you get the none, none that have been detected. The thing about vaccine side effects, gentlemen, is they can be rare, but it's, I would say, you never want to say never, but almost unheard of that there would be a long-term effect of a vaccine, a side effect of a vaccine that you don't see beginning to show up in the short term. So I taught, you know, most of these reactions are really fast within the first day or two, like the uh, allergic reactions that we talked about. Some of them um, like that, those very rare reactions to the J&J vaccine with the, with the clotting, those happen within the first, you know, six to, to 15 days, you know, so just a couple of, within a couple of weeks of vaccination, we haven't seen any evidence on any vaccines of longer term effects um, that didn't show up uh, in these uh, in some form in, in the short term. So uh, I don't know of any evidence to suggest issues with fertility um, from the vaccines at all. Okay, a couple more no, questions. Nor with other, other prior vaccines either. Right, right, right. Um, I'm going to ask you a question. I'm, I'm going to give you a minute to think about a big picture question. Then I'm going to ask you a very specific. It's, it's actually an insurance question. So for one of our agents coming in on an insurance and liability question, uh, and I'm going to ask that first. But but I want you to think about if you were president or if you were able to change one or two things in our current healthcare system of delivery. So whether it's managed care, Medicare, Medicaid, you know, single payer. Um, paying for prescription drugs or vaccines or anything else, this tele, you know, this telemedicine we, we've experienced all now through through COVID. Um, there's lots of trends out there, uh, longer term for healthcare delivery. But if you were kind of president and sitting and can wave your magic wand, um, what would you think those one or two things are we could change in society so healthcare delivery will be more efficient, less less costly, you name it. I think the most important thing, um, Joan, and this is obviously a longer question, but to me, it's it's changing the way that we pay for healthcare to focus more on value, to focus more on the things that matter most for people. So you mentioned telehealth, you've seen a big shift to telehealth, but what's really mattered isn't just telehealth by itself, but telehealth combined with data that, that people can track on their own, you know, using digital trackers about how their own health is doing, especially if you've got a chronic disease, you can be much more in charge of your health too, and you can work more effectively with your, your doctor, if, if you all are sharing that data, um, uh, getting um, uh, using remote monitoring from home, using team-based approaches to care, including things like, hey, if it's the most effective thing for your health, um, I'd love to see more health plans covering those, you know, those tri trips to the uh, getting a vaccine. Um, some of the healthcare organizations that are into this value-based care approach are also doing things like reaching out to their beneficiaries who haven't gotten vaccinated yet, finding out what their questions are. So their question about hesitancy, it's uh, for many people, it's, it's just, you know, this happened too fast. Is this really safe? Is this really effective? Where if you talk to your health professional that you trust, uh, you can get those questions answered. Or if there's someone in your community who's been vaccinated, who you trust, and there are lots and lots more people like that, you can get those questions answered. So good health systems will facilitate all of that. And that means changing the way that we pay, the so-called value-based payment, paying more for outcomes, you know, not just paying a lot because a drug is new or something like that, but paying because it's really having an impact on, on our health. Okay, fantastic. We're going to end with an insurance question. So do you see uh, a legal liability for larger venues as they reopen? So stadiums, concert halls, bars, if you will. I mean, there's a lot of, you know, this is an insurance crowd and people worried about being sued. And how is that going to be handled going forward? This is, as you said, COVID's here to stay or another variant of COVID, another pandemic, yeah. you know, in the future. So this is a big question. So this is a longer answer. In the public health emergency, there are some protections for businesses that reopen in compliance with uh, 
EOC right. with that, with, you know, guide, guidance related to an employer OSHA and related uh, um, CDC guidance. Looking forward, I think as long as there are clear disclosures around the additional risk for people who aren't wearing masks uh, and the like, uh, I don't see uh, um, big uh, liability issues arising. Uh, like I said, I'm much more concerned about uh, just trying to get the infection rates even further down and, and helping people who are unsure about the vaccine vaccine uh, uh, getting access. Well, with that, we are going to thank you. Uh, so, so tremendous to have you back uh, for our session. We had, you know, record turnout. We're thrilled that you're able to share your wisdom and insights with us. And, and again, thank you for all you've done in the public health arena and for your public service. And we're just grateful again to have you with us. So, so thank you, Dr. McClellan. Thanks for all you're doing. I hope everybody stays well. Okay. And then with that, my friends, I'm gonna just give you a couple of teasers on our upcoming webinars. Uh, next week, we have behind the scenes of the New York Stock Exchange, everything you wanna know about SPACs, IPOs, direct listings with uh, my friend, Amanda Henline, who is the head of global capital markets at the NYSE. Uh, and then in two weeks, we have uh, June 30th, the connection between ESG issues and a company's long-term sustainability uh, with former SEC commissioner, Paul Atkins and our traveler's own chief sustainability officer, Yafid Cohen. Uh, and then on July 14th, uh, you can listen in to understand how you can innovate like a unicorn with our own traveler's chief innovation officer, uh, talking a lot about innovation and insurance, uh, Kevin Smith, Alchemy Cruz, Sabine van der Linden, and uh, Beth Mers, the head of our uh, customer strategy in uh, personal insurance. Then on July 28th, we're gonna hear from Dr. Rob Hartwig. Uh, he's a well-known figure in insurance market insights. So register for all these programs at the travelersinstitute.org. It's also in the chat if you want to click on those buttons. So I invite you again to uh, connect with me on LinkedIn. And with that, wear your mask, get your vaccine, uh, get ready to open up this economy. Uh, it's going to come roaring back and we're already in, in standing ready to ensure all the uh, new GDP we're going to create together. So again, Dr. McClellan, thank you a million for joining us. Be safe, my friends, and have a great uh, week.